But for those who are watching on YouTube, I want to say thank you guys so much for watching. We greatly appreciate you guys' support. We know that you can be watching any video on YouTube out of all the billions of billions of videos, but you chose uh, to spend this moment with myself and these great people in Charlotte. For, with that being said, if you are in the Charlotte area, we would love to have you come and be a part of our local live uh, 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 group. Uh, feel free to come check us out at 3646 Central Avenue. Uh, there's links in the description box for you to get the correct address, if whatever, with that. But also feel free to go to our website. There's links there for you to give, get involved, and get plugged in, or get me out to your city. I would love to come travel out to where you are and serve your college, your city, your church, Lord willing. But feel free to go to Psalms uh, six, uh, 16, 5 through 6, and feel free to navigate with us. But for those who are listening on Google Play and Apple Podcasts, I want to say thank you guys so much for listening. SoundCloud as well. Can't forget you guys. Thank you guys so much for listening. Uh, feel free to also navigate in the description boxes as well. And for those watching this video and you want something to carry into your car, uh, you can go to SoundCloud, Google Play, or Apple Podcasts, and you'll be able to find uh, all these messages in downloadable form and streaming form. But for those in the room, let's go ahead and read Psalms 16, 5 through 6, and then we're going to break down some points that I really do believe will really help us seek counsel from God. <clears throat> the Lord is my chosen portion and my cup. You hold my lot. The lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Indeed, I have a beautiful inheritance. Bless the Lord. I will bless the Lord who gives me counsel in the night. Also, my heart instructs me. I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I shall not be shaken. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you for this grand opportunity you have given me <clears throat> as an unworthy servant to be able to do something so precious. I count it an honor, Father God, that you would utilize me as a vessel to be able to articulate your word the best that I can. That's why, Lord, I can't do it without your best, and that's your spirit that dwells in me. So, Holy Spirit, the governor of this atmosphere, the governor of my life, I pray that you will speak through me in ways that you have yet to speak through me, articulately, with passion, with purpose, but more importantly, your anointing that will destroy the yokes. And Father God, I count it an honor that your presence will join us this evening. So I pray the clouds open up and the heavenly hosts are engaging with us this evening to, 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 to look at curiously how men can and women can, can touch something so delicate. And through your text, God, as God breathed and perfect. So God, we just count it an honor that you would join us, God, like I always say. If you're not in this presence, in this place, I'm wasting their time. So God, speak through me as a vessel that knows he's nothing without you. God, I love you and I appreciate you. In Jesus' name we do pray, amen. Our objective, let's get right in there real quickly. Our objective this evening is to learn how to acquire and to apply the counsel of God. Our objective this evening is to learn how to acquire and to apply the counsel of God. It's very important for you and I to make sure that we go to, to God to make sure that we receive counsel for every key decision that we make in life. A lot of us are neglecting the opportunity that we have that Christ gave us by ripping the veil, giving us access to the Father, knowing that as his children, I can breathe and through repentance, I can use my, my voice and my adoption to be able to acquire curiously the will of God. So our objective, like I said before, is to learn how to acquire and to apply the counsel of God. But before we go into counsel, let's talk about what's evident in verse 7. Verse 7 says, I bless the Lord who gives me counsel. In the night also my heart instructs me. So before we get into the counsel, let's talk about what it means to bless God. Number one, to bless the Lord means to exalt him and to worship him. To bless the Lord means to exalt him and to worship him. Many people look at the term worship as, 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 as physical um, 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 demonstration. We look at worship based upon the lifting of hands, the singing of a song. But when it comes to blessing God, we're blessing God based upon our lifestyle, the style of life I choose to live. My question to you, when it comes to blessing God, is your, is your blessing worth anything? Is your uh, worship worth anything? Because your, whatever you uh, determine, whatever determines your worth receives your worship. And many of us, we worship things and we be like, Josh, what you mean? I don't worship no stone. I don't worship no other God. But our gods are not just tangible, they're intangible. Our gods are people. Our gods are ideologies. Our gods are concepts. And many times we find ourselves idolizing and worshiping something versus the one that created. It's crazy how we give more worth and value to what was created versus the one who created it. 
your worship. It's not based upon what you do on your Sunday services. It's not based upon what you do on the way to work with your windows down and that, that hill song playing just right. And, and, but worship is what you do when no one's watching. Your worship is just like your character. It's who you are <clears throat> when no one is watching. So to bless the Lord means to exalt him. Mean, exalt means he is at the pinnacle of our lives, that he is the top. He is the supreme. He's the, the, the cusp. He's the peak. And many of us have God not even in our top 10. And we got to ask ourselves, is God truly number one? Is he the number one person who's receiving our worship? To exalt him means in every area of my life, you will see Christ working in me. Listen, that's why we got to make it our objective to say, God, everywhere I am, People who have sense will know you're being exalted. It's hard to be exalted when you're faced with trouble. It's hard to exalt him when you don't have a good understanding of him. See, when, when you know he's been that good, you can't help but say, God, I exalt you. And to worship means, God, <clears throat> make sure that every aspect of my life is giving you the worship you deserve. God does not demand our worship. He deserves it. We're looking for, many people look at our God, the God of the Bible, as one who's some egotistical, philosophical, big-headed monster who demands worship from his people. No, 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 no. He says, listen, I don't even articulate how much I demand it. I'm going to just let my actions prove to you that I deserve it. Listen, he says, no other person can make you breathe but me. No other person has given you life. No one has ever said that you was beautiful in the midst of your sins. And you want to worship things that still critiques you, cri criticize you after you give everything to them. We got to make sure that we get to a place where we are content in him. Because when we're content in him, it doesn't matter what they criticize or critique about us. I know in whom I believe. Number two, in order for our worship to reach God, we must be right with God. <clears throat> Excuse me. In order for our worship to reach God, we must be right with God. In order for our worship to reach him, we must be right. Now, now righteousness or being right with God is not predicated on our works. It's not predicated on how often, you know, many people get so caught up in perfect attendance and straight A's with God. God says, man, there's a lot of people who have F's with me, D's with me, C's with me, but as long as they got an E for effort, <laughs> they're doing better than the people that come off with straight A's. And many of us get so consumed with, with working for his love. Listen, when you're working for his love, you ain't truly received his love. Because he didn't pursue you because of your works, because he's looking for perfection. The perfect blood that was slain, he's looking for that. The people that was with Moses inside of the room, they wasn't perfect, but there was a perfect lamb's blood that was on a doorpost that when a deaf angel came, the deaf angel didn't knock on the door to see how perfect their life was. They saw what was on the brink, on the edge of their life. That's why we got to say, God, I'm going to make sure that I trust in Jesus' righteousness, that his, what he did for me, I trust in. That means when I make a mistake, I know for a fact that I have been adopted as his son. Therefore, he, listen, anyone with a child, anyone who has something they love dearly, that's a breathing human being, you know for a fact that your love for that individual is unconditional. God's love for us is not based upon conditions. The only basis on his love was the conditions of the Christ. All he cares about is what he perfectedly done through his son. That's why I don't have to work. If I mess up, I know for a fact I can go to Pops and be like, God, I apologize. I repent with deep remorse. I got to make sure do I have fruit keeping with repentance to ensure that when I truly worship and when I truly pray, my prayers and my worship doesn't just hit the ceiling and come down, but it's so infused with fire and potency that it pierces through not just things made by man, but piercing through the rocks of demonic climate where principalities are trying to keep believers prayers from reaching God. Is your prayer and your worship a flame or is your prayer and worship a mist that you see for a moment and fades away? I want to make sure that my life is so right with God because of my dependency on what Jesus did for me and in my counsel and my guidance by the spirit that he gifted to me that I know when I pray and I know when I worship, I know it reaches him. People get so concerned. Well, why hasn't God reached back? <laughs> God's reaching back is predicated on his right timing. Listen, God may not guarantee. God doesn't always send what you ask for 
but he sends you assurance that he heard. Many of us were like, God, where's the answer? He said, no, I send you assurance that I've heard you, but I'm not gonna let your passion and your tears and your curiosity pudge, budge my integrity beyond its point. Listen, it doesn't matter how much you cry, how much you pout, or how much you suffer, if it ain't God's timing, it's not his timing. In order for our worship to reach God, we must be right with God. Accepting Jesus' righteousness means I don't got to work, but that doesn't mean that we don't endeavor. Many people get so caught up, well, I guess I just sit here and wade in my sins. <laughs> I guess I'll continue to wade at this level of, of, of no, no, no. We got to be in regiment with God. We got to be working out with God. He sent us not just a comforter, but he sent us a trainer. He sent us a person that's going to spar with us, organize our lives, instruct us to instill strength, endurance, discipline, patience. And his gem that he fits you in is called patience. Because he knows when patience has her perfect work in you, you will be able to handle everything precious that's sent from God. A lot of us said, I was going to go through this quick. Let's keep going. Number three, the level of our appreciation directly affects our affections and our application. The level of our appreciation directly affects our affections and our application. Appreciation leads to abundance. Depreciation leads to depression. The level of our appreciation directly affects our affections and our application. Appreciation leads to abundance. Depreciation leads to depression. Your level of appreciation for God and honor for him directly affects your affections and your application. Now, what does that mean? If you somewhat appreciate God, then you somewhat are in love with God. And if you're somewhat in love with God, you somewhat apply what he wants you to do. But if you truly appreciate and honor who he has been, who he is and what he has promised to do, your affections. Listen, who's that person you love the most? When they walk in, <laughs> when they walk in the room, you got butterflies. You walk in the room, you acting like you don't notice him. You act like you don't notice her. You trying to act all cool, calm because you all nervous and your palms are sweaty, knee weak, arms is heavy, all these different things. And you're finding yourself in a place of nervousness. We should get to a place where we're so in love of God that he gets the first fruits of our affection, that he gets the first fruits of our love. That when we say, but God, because you listen, the way, how you wake up, how you articulate your appreciation directly de de determines how far you go for God, <laughs> not how far you'll go with God how far you will go for him. You know when you have a good coach, a good coach that you really wanna play hard for, or a manager that you really appreciate, you'll go the extra mile for. The same as with God. God, man, you've been too good, man. Grace, so valuable, but was given so freely. I can't help but give you my best. Listen, he gave us his best. We should give him our best. But if you don't appreciate him, some of us go days without even saying thank you. He let us breathe days and we don't even give him a chance. We don't even give ourselves the opportunity to say, God, you know what? I appreciate you. Listen, appreciation is a way of life. Your attitude determines your altitude. Your attitude determines your atmosphere. The attitude you have with God will determine the presence of God in your life. He don't, he don't like stank attitudes. He don't like stank appreciation. He wants people that truly honor him, that truly say, God, I'm so thankful. Because those people continuously get, those people continuously get blessed by God. We're not talking about financial. We're just talking about favor. We're talking about his, 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 his love, man. Like We got to get to a place where we say, you know what, God? If it's just you and me, I'm okay. Number four, a deep appreciation for God and a devoted application to his word and wisdom will lead to the removal of many of our problems. <clears throat> when it comes to getting counsel from God, it's, it's impossible to be in a river of receiving wisdom and receiving counsel from God if there is no deep appreciation and devoted application. Now, what does that mean? Shallow appreciation will never help you receive anything in life. But when you have deep appreciation, I'm talking about those type of moments when you have with God, you so appreciate God, 
tears be falling out your eyes. You know what I'm saying? Because you begin to say, God's gifts outweighs the grace in our minds. When God gifts us, those people appreciate his grace. It's like, man, you, you still going to give this to me? Man, there'd be some things God do for me. I'd be like, man, I can't even look at it. I don't even deserve it, God. God, I, I, that level of humility that can only be birthed through humiliation. <laughs> There's a level of humility that comes from humiliation. <laughs> when you've been humiliated and your way of life has been scarred the way you thought was OK, when you've been humiliated because of your weaknesses, because of your ideologies and thinking that you're strong, when you've really been humiliated, then humility births. I will bless the Lord always. Not because he demands it, but because he deserves it. Let's transition. Let's talk about how to seek and receive counsel from God. Verse 7 again says, I bless the Lord who gives me counsel. This is David talking. In the night, also my heart instructs. So today we're going to be talking about uh, the blessing God, receiving counsel from God, and assuring that our heart belongs to God. Let's go to the problem. Many believers are either not in position to be counseled by God or are not patient enough to receive counsel from God. Many believers are either not in position to be counseled by God or are not patient enough to receive counsel from God. Their lack of patience and poor positioning is proof they don't truly honor God or his plans for them. Many believers are either not in position to be counseled by God or are not patient enough to receive counsel from him. Their lack of patience <clears throat> and poor positioning is proof that they don't truly honor him or his plans for them. Honor helps habits. Many people make key decisions without God and suffer the consequences for them. I know that's a mouthful, but I want to give you all that before I unpack it. Many believers are either not in position to be counseled by God or not patient enough. Their lack of patience and poor positioning is proof that they don't truly honor God and his plans for them. Honor helps habits. Many people make key decisions without God and suffer the consequences for them. Positioning and patience. The number one ingredients when it comes to your purpose, I posted this on Twitter and I said it in the video, is patience. To be counseled by God means that his voice matters. Whoever's voice matters to you most will determine the victories in your life. Does his voice really matter to you? I can prove it simply based upon how quick you seek him and how long you wait to hear from him and the obedience that follows after you heard. Obedience is not based upon, well, I waited and I was here listening. God don't care about you just hearing. He doesn't even care about you just understanding. He cares about you applying. Are you in position to be counseled? And do you have enough patience to wait for it? Positioning. Positions matter. Being at the right place at the right time matters. Each and every one of us need counsel. Can I get two or three people to tell me what are two or three things, one per person, or what people need counsel most on? What are, what are the areas or the things that people desperately need godly counsel for? Marriage. marriage why marriage? Oh, yeah, my bad. I know. It's a big decision. It's a big decision. <clears throat> That's true. Marriage, what's next? Sex? Why sex? I feel you. I feel you. Some things don't need no words. <laughs> I feel you, but some things, some things you just got to moans and groans, the Lord says when you're praying. Anyway, third person. We said marriage, sex, and what's the third thing? Yes. Raising children. I'm talking like I have some. But working at a school made me feel like I'm raising something. <laughs> Let's talk about marriage. Why, Josh, do we need to wait for counsel for marriage? Because, like I say this many times, there are a lot of people you are compatible with 
but it doesn't mean that's who God has for you. We look for chemistry, we're looking for connection, but we don't look for Christ in it. Christ must be in the marriage because he designed it. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God. We got to get to a place where we know that this orchestration, this com com compiling of, of two vessels coming together is in parallel to the most powerful thing on this earth. That's God and us. We got to make sure we understand that whoever you partner with will determine if how you prosper and how far you pushed forward. People just be partnering with people and don't even process what this person is. Seeking counsel from God means, hey, listen, before we, listen, we, before we even take a step forward, <laughs> before you even take me to dinner, <laughs> well, 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 before you even do anything with me, I need to know. We're not sitting there saying you met somebody at a church event, you're like, oh, he's cute and she's cute. Well, that's a possibility. Before your heart even flutters, you find God about it. Many of our hearts, we'd be like, forget God. I like this one. <laughs> We got to say, no, 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 <clears throat> no. Because my, my, my faith is secured, if your faith is not secured in God, you'll be fervent in spirit after the wrong things. When you know that your faith is anchored and you know that God has the best for you coming and he has the best in of himself with you now, you don't just follow anything because if you all about your feelings, you'll follow things that will only have you frustrated at the end. Many people get so caught up, well, if I find someone, I'll be okay. That's the main substratum of idolatry. That if I have this, I'm something. If I have some, many people look at their singleness and be like, well, since I don't have nobody, I must not be a, a valuable to God. That if I don't have this type of money or whatever, I'm not valuable enough. God says your value and your worth is not predicated on what man determines. It's based upon what I determined from the beginning of time. When it comes to marriage, you got to ask yourself, what empire are we going to build? Well, how, what's, what, 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 how are we going to raise our kids? Listen, I tell little people, you, you better interview <laughs> before you hire somebody into your life. Interviewing means you asking all kind of off the wall questions. You finding, you discerning. And sometimes many of us don't even got a tab. And, uh, we, don't even, we shouldn't even take the time to even ask them a question because we know from the beginning the Spirit of God be like, no, he ain't the one. She ain't the one. But what we do is, no, 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 God, you tripping, man. That's, that's indigestion. That ain't really God talking to me. No, no, that ain't, I should have drunk more water. No, no, we got to say, no, 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 God, I trust the knower. We're talking about that grunge, that, 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 that thing that go like this and you'd be like, man, oh man, it's really, we're talking about the spirit, not the soul. The soul will confuse you. Let me break this down because people was asking me questions, the difference between spirit and soul. Your body gives you world consciousness. Your soul gives you self-consciousness. Your spirit gives you God consciousness. Your spirit, man, is where God speaks. When you were saved, someone, the Holy Spirit came into your life and cut the light on. That's what happened. He says, oh, look at that. <laughs> the Spirit is alive now. After your spirit has been enlightened to the truth, your soul now has to be cleansed. The Bible says, do not be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Your mind and your emotions is your soul compartment. That's why many people get saved, but don't allow God to wash their soul. What we got to do is, yes, I'm saved, but I ain't sanctified. <laughs> I'm saved, but my soul is not cleansed. If your spirit is right and your soul is being renewed, your natural physical affections and desires will follow suit of the leading of the spirit of God. The reason why people are still sexually charged, still stuck on addictions, still falling in this area is because they have been saved, but they haven't allowed the Holy Spirit to wash them. Every compartment. We're talking about every area of your soul. That means every thought, every stronghold, every soul tie, every curiosity, everything. When was the last time that you audited your life? We should audit our lives like the IRS audits most people. We got to look for every coin. We got to look for everything and be like, I'm not going to leave a corner unswept. Father God, Show me me. And when God shows you you, you don't got time to be talking about nobody else's life. It's so sad that people comment more on other people's life than comment on their own. 
If you comment on your own life, you don't got time to be strolling to see the, the issues and ugliness in somebody else's life. You'll be like, God, I got too much mess to be worrying about her mess. I got too much mess to be worrying about their mess because I know I got enough of mess of my own. That's why I don't be talking about no Trump. I don't be talking about no NFL players. I don't be talking about no pastors. I don't be talking about nothing because I ain't God. And as long as they got air in their lungs, God can still reach them. So we disqualify ourselves when we reach with critique. When we go and criticize everybody, then God says, well, man, if they watch you watch your YouTube, they ain't going to want to talk to you because you were talking trash about them. But we got to get to a place where we say, God, <laughs> I ain't worrying about what they got going on in their life. I'm making sure that I'm preparing for marriage. Listen, man, we heard a lot of people talk about that marriage is not easy. We got to get to a place where we say, God, I'm not going to waste the time that you have given me to prepare. Or for those who are married, you got to be able to say, who is the foundation of this thing? Is God really in the midst? It's so many relationships where they don't even have Bible study together. They don't marry couples, don't pray together. Men ain't leading, women ain't submitting, men ain't sacrificing, people ain't following the scriptures because they got in it emotionally versus spiritually. And whatever you become emotionally attached to without a spiritual foundation, that thing will rock you, shake you, and everything that's not built on a rock will crumble. And all of us who build our relationships on sinking sand when the, war, when the waters and the storms come, we lose. That's why you better take this life seriously because, man, I'm turning 32 this year and I'm already nervous that in the blink of an eye, I'll be 62. And that's why I'm like, no, I'm taking every day patiently to prepare for the moments that God wants me to manage. Don't ask for a moment that you know good and well you cannot manage. You can't even manage your single life. You're talking about managing a man. You can't even manage your single. Are you talking about managing a household, man? We got to get to a place that is, if my finances ain't right, <clears throat> how am I? No, I'm, I hope she's good at finances. <laughs> I hope he's good at this. No, no, no. We got to be good at this. <laughs> All of our credit scores, we got to be up. <laughs> you know, we got to make sure that we're in, in, <clears throat> in a position to prosper. But if we're not in position with God and seeking him diligently, we'll never prosper. Number two was sex. The Bible says, don't awaken love before it's time. Waking love before it's time is like waking a bear after hibernation. Many of us do not understand the beauty of sex. He is the one that created sex. He created the organs. He created the pleasure of it. He created it. He knows what you like. <clears throat> you don't got to worry about, you know, trying something out. You don't got to worry about seeing if this right. God knows what's best for you. And you say, God, I'm awake for you. Because when you start awakening sexual love before it's time and you begin to listen to Luther and, and, and Tyson, or whatever, not who Tyson, Tank and all, you don't listen to all these different people. Lord have mercy. Anyway, you start listening to all these people and you start reinvigorating your passions all of a sudden. You touch something that you can't manage. The safest place for sex is in a marriage where both the husband and the wife are completely submitted to God. No other place is sex safe. Sex ain't even safe if one person's completely submitted to God. Sex ain't safe if, if, if two people are somewhat committed. No, no. Sex is only safe because when both people are completely submitted to God. Listen, listen. When you get married, them skirts are only going to get shorter. The hair is only going to flow better. The muscles are only going to get bigger. And you're going to find yourself in places when storms come against your marriage and your wife is pregnant and your husband is stressed and sex ain't prominent. All of a sudden you get curious. <clears throat> See, <clears throat> when you're in love, when you love the person's body more than you love the person's spirit, you're going to find yourself tempted beyond that place. You, listen, you got to fall in love with the person, not the package. You got to fall in love with the person, not how they're... When you fall in love with how she's framed and fall in love with how she do this and how he does that, you're going to co confuse yourself on what love is. Because I've learned a lot of people say, man, they don't be having sex that often. They do in the beginning, but life happens, things happen. And if you have the wrong perspective of sex and you're not even in a position to be nurtured and understanding on how to, to, to protect your worth and your value, listen, you're gonna have four or five people in your bed and there's only two people laying there. 
because you're bringing that person in. You ain't got that soul tile. Now you're comparing him on how he hit it. Now you're comparing on how she moves. And all of a sudden now you got a pornography addiction. Now all of a sudden if she can't do the split right, if she can't do these kind of moves like that, all of a sudden now you can't even get up for the wife that God brought you. You got to get to a place where you say, God, clean out of me everything that's wicked, lustful. Because when I have sex with my wife, I don't want to have sex. I want to make true love. I don't want to make lust. I want to make love. And many people are making lust with their spouse and they wonder why they look, they love Lover leaves. You got to have the right perspective in knowing that God created it. It's precious in the eyes of God. The bed is undefiled. And he has a love for you. People want passion. They want sexual passion, but they don't want patience. If you find a brother or a sister that can suffer along with you, that's a keeper. People don't know how to stay in nothing and fight for nothing. We got, if, how can we be patient in this area if we ain't really honoring patience here? Lust is impulsive. Love is patient. We got to get to a place where we say, God, I got to make sure I get a better grip on this lust in my heart before this lust have me lingering into situations that I'm not prepared for. And you ain't that strong. The preacher ain't that strong. But listen, I got, I got systems upon systems. I got guardrails. I don't bowl without the bumpers. We listen, we're going to get strikes. We, we're not going to be in a gutter at all because I don't want to live in a gutter. I want to stay in the middle. And when I stay in the middle and I stay fixated on Christ, I don't got to worry about finding my mind in the gutter, my life in the gutter, and my habits in the gutter. That's why you got to say, God, I am more afraid of me than who's against me. If you ain't scared of you, you'll always lose. I am scared of me. <laughs> if I open my heart and you saw what was in it, you'll close it quickly. <laughs> I'm scared of me. And not, ev not everybody have, has the right type of fear of themselves. God, I don't trust me. So I need to prepare for marriage. God, I don't trust me. God, give me covenant eyes. Fine tune my eyes. Fellas, if they walk by, yeah, man, listen, bro. We live in the last days. And less and less and less. And you listen, the first look ain't a problem. If they in your periphery, they in your peripheral. But if you look, that's the that's evidence of what's in your heart. Ladies, if you become so longing, and if he even quotes half a scripture, you in love. And some of these ladies are so if he if he just knows some word, if he knows just a little bit, hmm, the devil know the word. <laughs> He was there when it was written. He was curiously tap dancing around it to see what would be so mysteriously planted about the Christ being in every book he wrote. He was there when the word was written and he's making sure it's not written on your heart. You got to get to a place where it says, I will hide your word in my heart that I might not sin against thee. That means, listen, you can't carry your Bible everywhere, unfortunately. You can, but I, my Bible can't even fit in none of my pockets. <laughs> study Bibles and stuff. Listen, you got to hide it in your heart because when you in war, you got to you got to carry what you can carry. You got to make sure I'm going to pack my heart with all these with these with these uh, purity scriptures. I'm going to pack my heart with all these patient scriptures. I'm going to pack my heart with everything about about my life. So that when I'm out there in the field and I'm away from the base, I got enough in my heart to get me through raising children. I can't really talk much about that because I don't have none of my own. But when it comes to peeking into how children respond to certain things in the school I work at shows me how precious parenting is. <clears throat> These kids, man, be talking about, I'll be, <laughs> in my head, I'd be like, man, I see this is birth control right here. <laughs> I'm looking at birth control. Don't even worry about we ain't enough birth control. But God was like, you ain't gonna raise your kids like they raise their kids. Babies raising babies. That's why if you, if you're trying to make babies, you better make sure you're ready to raise babies. Most people don't have patience enough or don't want to seek counsel enough on when God wants you to go in that next stage. Many people put too many burdens and I don't, I don't even want to say burdens because children are a blessing. But blessings outside of God's timing can be heavy like burdens. You got to make sure God is leading you and making sure that you're ready for the next step. Let's keep going. <clears throat> Y'all all right?
Many believers are either not in position, meaning they're not even in the place, in the presence of God. They don't even take any time to either seek him. They don't even time to be where he is. We worship, say, I want to be where you are. But when we wear, when, when he shows up, we're not there. <clears throat> or we're not patient enough to receive counsel. Meaning that when God, when we ask God, sometimes God's silence is trying to sanctify us or trying to show us on how we can secure ourselves. Meaning when he's quiet, we go to the book. When he's quiet, we go to what was written. When he's quiet, he's given us time to look at ourselves. Their lack of patience and poor position is proof they don't truly honor God or his plans for them. Honor helps habits. Many people make key decisions without God and suffer the consequences for them. Honor helps habits. When I honor God, I'll practice the right thing. Let's go to the calls. I'm already 40 minutes in. Okay. Calls. The cause of this problem is due to our need for tangible counsel, a lack of understanding and honor of God, and our desire to control our lives. The calls to the reason why we're not in position and the calls on why we're not patient is based upon our need for tangible counsel, a lack or poor understanding or honor of God for God, and our desire to control our lives. Meaning, we go to people before we go to God. We go to the pastor, we go to parishioners, we go to different people before we go, go, go to God. God never said to go to people first. People are only supposed to confirm what God has said to you. There ain't no new revelations. When God reveals, people are supposed to reflect what God revealed. Not giving you, I think you, there's nothing wrong when people say that, but you got to take what they say and put it to what God says. Chew to me, my mommy say, chew to me, spit out the bones. We got to get to a place in our lives where we say, I'm going to make it a habit that before I go to my spiritual mom, my spiritual father, my pastor, my best friend, I'm going to go to God first. That's not easy. We're looking for someone we can touch. Help me. They have finite minds. They don't know everything like God knows about you. The reason why we're failing because we're not fervent and diligent in seeking him. God, I'm going to stay here until you speak to me. That don't mean you physically stay there. We're talking about your spirit stays connected. I can roam with my phone, but my phone is still connected to the provider. I can roam, I can go, but as long as I'm connected, I'm guaranteed to answer the call. But when we always go to people before we go to God, we start, give us, we start taking their words as gospel <clears throat> versus going to God and saying, what do you truly have for me? Oh, your mom be like, well, you've been single for a long time. He, he's good. He's, he'll do. <laughs> Look at how he's playing with your son. Oh, he'll do. Now, now, God won't have you wait. And your dad's saying stuff and your mom's saying stuff and your friends are saying stuff. And all of a sudden, you getting clarity from a person. You getting insight from a person. That, listen, how many people gave you advice? Then when the advice didn't work, you go back to them and they forgot they gave you the advice. <laughs> it happens all the time. Did I really say that? Oh, my bad. Some people just give you advice just to get you out of their, get you out of their space. They give you advice based upon selfish reasons. Or some people really genuinely want to help you. But listen, not everybody's good help is good help. Some people's good help is help that hinders. We got to say, you know what, God? I'm a practice going to you first. I don't care about tangible counsel because, God, I'm going to consult my internal counsel before I consult the external counsel. God will send you people that will confirm, that will be sensitive enough to say, or will be content and strong enough in themselves to say, well, did you ask God first? When people ask me to counsel, I always try to ask them, what did God say to you first? I can give you five or six things. I can give you, I can generalize it. I can specify it. <laughs> I can make it whatever you need. But I want to make sure that you truly heard. Tangible counsel or 
The reason why people find themselves in this problem is because they have a lack of honor and understanding for God. Listen, when you lack understanding about God, you will fall into false doctrines. You'll fall into false expectations. You'll find yourself over here thinking this is how God would do it. Many of us at one point thought of God more of a Santa Claus than a savior. We thought more of him being someone that just comes down once a year or hopefully every day and drop presents off versus being a sovereign God that knows what's best for you despite the season that you're in. Listen, without storms, what I'm trying to say with that? What I'm trying to say is storms are necessary. When I went to Miami, you know, we live in the Piedmont area of the Carolinas. We see trees everywhere. We see, you know, siding. We see wood homes. We see, you know, when you go to Miami, they got these clay cement walls because they know this area is in a region where there's storms. So what they do is I build my life based upon the region that I'm in and the frequency of storms that comes through this area. And when you're in ministry and when you're following God and you're trying to be the light in a dark place, you in a region where many storms come. Storms weren't designed to sink you. They were designed to wash you. They were coming to your life to build resilience and the ability to stand. Let's keep going. Some people just want to control their lives. They don't want God to control. Man, walking by faith is not easy. Trusting God for the next meal, trusting God for your marriage, trusting God for your money, trusting God. Listen, can I be honest with being a preacher? And being in this thing is hard, man. I literally got to walk by faith and not by sight. I can't even see them all. <laughs> that force field of faith is so dense and thick that all I can see is now. And that's how God wants to program us. When you look at your past and you look at your future more than your present, you're robbing yourself of development and connecting yourself with God. Now is what you're only guaranteed. Let go of your life and let, let God control it. When we lack honor, we lose help. He will help you navigate out of trouble, but will, not, but will never nurture you in trouble. What I mean, well, let me say that again. He will help you navigate out of problems, but he will never nurture you in the problem. Now what I mean by that? Wrong places. When we do not follow God and honor him, we lose help in certain places. Why would God help you in regards to nurturing you when you're in the wrong place? He'll help you get out of it if your heart truly wants out of it. But it's hard for him to endorse you in a place that he didn't design for you. How many of us find ourselves in places that God never sent us and we're wondering why God doesn't sustain us while we're in a place that he never sent us? Some of us will be going into places. You can go to a desert, but if that's where God wants you to be, you'll flourish. But what we do, we look for the greenest pastures. So we navigate for ourselves into wrong places. And then when you find out that he crazy and you find out this was the wrong job, now you're asking God, but I really like it. But God's like, no, 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 this ain't for you. Let's keep going. Y'all all right? Y'all quiet? Y'all hot? Y'all tired? Y'all sleepy? Long week? Friday the 13th tomorrow? Y'all all right? Anyway, <laughs> y'all ain't know that. All counsel from God is correct. Y'all better, be, better be attentive. <laughs> These type of days, full moons, Friday the 13th, certain days, solstice and that's where there's a lot of human sacrifices and animal sacrifices. That's why we ever been in, you've been in, uh, in uh, driving and you see like everyone's acting weird and crazy. That's because there's a lot of demonic activity in the climate. And if you're not aware, that's why don't be, don't count it strange that your week was kind of crazy. Don't count it strange if tomorrow people acting weird. There's a lot of stuff going in the demonic climate even now 
That's going to that's going to do warp a lot of believers movement. So don't don't count it strange. Study to show yourself approved. Know what type of world you in and knowing that the devil is the God of this world, not the earth, the world system. And if you don't know what you're in, you'll find yourself bruised, damaged and messed over. All counsel from God is correct, clear and concise. All counsel from God is correct, clear and concise. It is my responsibility to be in position and it's my responsibility to practice patience because I know I bless him because he counsels me. I bless him because I know that whatever I ask from him will be correct, will be clear, and will be concise. God don't be doing no riddles with us. He don't be doing no, he, listen, his counsel is correct, clear, and concise. He is not the author of confusion. He's the author of clarity. If you're confused, something that is not of God is in the midst of your ponderings. That's why you got to say, I, listen, God knows your husband by name, middle name, last name. He knows how tall. He knows. He knows your wife's name, middle, everything he knows. He knows what city you're supposed to be in. He knows what block. He knows what house. He knows what color on the walls. He is specific. But we don't diligently seek him enough. We want the sporadic, but we don't want the specific. God, just give me a vagueness. Just give, no, 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 no. If no one wasn't specific, the ark would have drowned or sunk. If, if Solomon, if God, everything that God gave his people was specific. Listen, if you want your destiny, observe the details. If you want to be great, observe the guidelines. If you want to be best, observe the borders. You get, if, you want the, if you want the best from God, I, God, I'm not leaving until you give me specifics. And be, have you been in a place where God actually gave you specifics? Listen, I ain't leaving until he give me specifics. Because if he says she the one, I know for a fact that when we argue and we get upset with each other, I know you sent me here. God, I'm going to you, God. I'm, I know she crazy, Lord, but you sent me. And when I'm crazy, she'll know he, God sent me. If you don't know that God sent you, you'll be quick to leave. People leaving churches, leaving places. If, if you were sent, you stay. People leave because, oh, he said this. People are imperfect. Why do people don't even want to be around us? Let alone we complain about who we're around. Listen, you got to take your time to say, God, give me your specifics. Because if you don't have the specifics, whatever you build will have defects. Whatever you build will be premature. And whatever you try to sell on these ocean waters will sink. If you don't do the specifics, if you don't take time to say, God, give me the specifics on what to do. And God, I trust your spirit that you will give me the specific words in that hour that I need it. That's why you got to discern how dependent am I on God? God, I'm on you like white on rice. I'm in your presence and I ain't leaving. Oh, man, when I'm in his presence, man, that's treasures, man. The reason why people don't want to be in silence because their thoughts are more tormented than they are treasure. People always find themselves busy. I got to get a third job. I got to get a fourth job. I got to, because I don't want to be alone. Oh, I love being alone. He gives me gold. God, I, listen, you wake me up at two in the morning, I'm up like this. Because I know you're trying to give me some specifics. How do you want this program? How do you want this ministry? How do you want these notes? How do you want these shirts? How do you, God, give me the specifics. Because when I know your specifics, man, I know everything would be terrific because I know God with you, everything is correct. Everything is clear. God don't confuse you. And it's concise, meaning he'll lay it out for you. Are you willing to seek that kind of counsel from God? Before you entertain anything, you engage with your heavenly father. You talk to your father, you pray. I don't care if it takes you 21 days, you stay on your knees before you. Listen, that job can wait. 
If that's your job and you ain't sure, that job will be there. If your house is what you want and you know, listen, 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 I ain't buying nothing, I ain't messing with nothing, I ain't engaged with nothing. God, listen, don't let nobody rush you out of being patient. Don't let nobody rush you out of seeking God's time with God because what people do is, well, hurry up. Why are you taking so long? No, 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 listen, y'all can go. Mm -mm. I don't care if I'm 35, I don't care if I'm 36, I don't care if I'm 40, I'm waiting. Oh, Rebecca, hmm. how can you be blameless and barren at the same time? Many years she was faithful to God. Barren, didn't have no children. The women around her, back in the Bible days, being barren means that you ain't blessed. So imagine being 40, 50, 60 years old and being barren, but God, I'm blameless. God, I've been faithful. And God said, I'm bearing you for a specific reason. Some of us, we complain while we're barren. The reason why many of us are barren and we ain't producing right now, because God said, I got a specific time. Oh man, if you would have birthed it too soon, it would have blew up in your face. Man, if you would have got married a year and a half ago, people, people make me chuckle sometimes. I giggle, I laugh. When they be like, well, uh, you, know, you know, I'm gonna get married now. I'm like, man, what, what you rushing for? Well, I only, we only, trust God, bro. Trust him. Because his purpose is specific. And if we don't take our time to seek him, We'll squander everything he wants to give to y'all. Y'all all right? Yes, Let's keep going. Let's talk about God's responsibility and our responsibility into receiving counsel. Real quick, I'm going to go through these. I'm going to go rapid fire, kind of, unless God wants me to sit on something. Um, but in order, God's responsibility and our responsibility when it comes to seeking counsel. In order to receive clear counsel from God, you must allow him to console you, correct you, carve out of you, and create in and out of you. In order, this is God's responsibility, if you allow. In order to receive clear counsel from God, you must allow him to console you. A soul that's not consoled is a soul that cannot be trusted. Before God gives you counsel, he's trying to bring peace to your soul. I'm going to allow you, God, to console me. When was the last time you had one of them ugly cries with God? Mascara all over the floor. Thinking, people thinking you dressed up for Halloween. <laughs> bruh, you cry so hard, man. Neighbors are knocking on your door like, bruh, you all right? You had an ugly cry, man, where you just got it all out. Has your soul cried? Have you allowed your soul to remove the toxins out. Talk to God about what that dude Jim did. You talk to God about what Kelly did. You talk to God about, get it out. The reason why we're not handling our blessings well, the reason why we're not executing at a high level, we're holding on to things that we ain't letting out. When are you gonna allow God to actually give you a hug? <laughs> to console you? Because if your, if your soul is a river that's untamed, a horse that's not tame, a soul that's relentless and not rested, God does not send counsel to a restless soul, but a soul at rest. Because he knows if I try to counsel you now, your soul is so bipolar that you receive it with joy and then you walk away from me. You need to go to God and be honest with him and say, listen, go to God today and throughout the weekend and write down everything that has hurt you and is hurting you. God, I'm hurt. You ain't going to be able to see, receive clear counsel if you're hurt. You're not going to be able to build a temple for him if you're bruised. You're not going to be able to help him if you're hindered because of what has happened to you. Forgive your pops, yo. Forgive mom. Forgive your sister. Forgive that molester. Forgive that person that raped you. Forgive that person that took your money. Forgive them quickly. 
If you don't, man, you ain't going to be able to be able to, to follow through with God, whatever God wants you to do. You got to forgive quickly because he quickly forgave you. And if you don't allow him to console you, whatever you allow inside of you will only mold you and you'll be like molded bread. You'll be rotten. You'll be not even tasteful anymore. You will be sour. Are you allowing him to console you? Are you allowing him to correct you? Some, listen, people be like, man, you know, when people be saying it's reckless, I don't just, I don't correct people I don't have a relationship with. I don't correct people who have not given me a license to correct them. Mentorship, discipleship is based upon finding someone that you're allowing God to sharpen you with. Some of us haven't even given God a license to correct us. You ain't touching this. That's why we don't read our Bibles because the Bible is a two-edged sword. It pierces through. We don't want to read because we know if we read, we held accountable to what we have read. We don't, we don't, we don't, we don't want to, we only want to worship God. We don't want the word of God. That's why these churches are so full because they put more money in their musical. They put more money in their, in their, in their CDs and their albums. They put more money in the presentation, the marketing plan. than they do the man plan, building the man, building the woman. They don't, they care more about because we know people don't like being uncomfortable. And when you preach that truth, people can't take or handle the truth. But you got to give God license to correct you. You got to be able to let God bring people around you that can talk some sense into your life. That can say, hey, man, you tripping here. The reason why many people are the way they are, believers, I'm saying, is because they're undiscipled. When you're undiscipled, you don't have nobody saying, bro, you tripping a line. Erase that status. You tripping. When nobody has nobody saying, man, why are you posting those pictures, bro? People don't want counsel or correction because if I have correction in my life, then you're going to be watching me until I correct it. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But you have to allow God to chin, chin chuck you. You need him to carve out of you. Man, you got to give him access to be able to pull things out of you. Carve in you and carve outside of you. Shaping in what I'm saying, your character. You also need to allow him to create in you a new heart and to renew you a right spirit. And you also got to allow him to create out of you. You got to be able to let God be able to create in you. And as what he's creating in you, you got to give him the license to pull that book out of you. Pull that album out of you. Pull that corporation out of you. Pull that ministry out of you. If you don't give God the clearance, you will not allow God to clean you out. Now, in order to receive clear counsel from God, you must do these things real quickly. You must ab completely abandon certain lifestyles. In order to receive clear counsel from God, you have to completely abandon certain lifestyles. If you're shacking, if you're having sex, if you're doing drugs, if you're a habitual liar, if you're addicted to pornography, if you're addicted to anything, there's too much sin for God to send in counsel. How can God send in when you got this murky fog in your soul? You got to say, I can't live this way no more if I want my path straightened. I can't live this life anymore if I want to hold what he desires for us to hold in these earthen vessels. You got to get rid of certain lifestyles. I got to get rid of certain lifestyles. I got to always make sure not new year, new me, new day, new me. Every day I'm going to try to meet a new me, add a new aspect of myself because God is not waiting. Well, let's wait to January. We'll touch your life until January 1st. No. Touch me now. Show me now. Man. Anybody perfect in the room? Nobody, but I promise you we got we got enough imperfections inside of each and every one of us to wrap around the universe 50 million times. So we should be busy. <laughs> we should listen what I tell you yesterday. I said many people get so caught up on on um, Jesus when he was baptized. People were saying, 
Well, you know, dang, his ministry started when he was baptized. Meaning, people are waiting for God to descend like a dove to let you know something. But Jesus was 30 when the dove came down. But at 12, he said, I'm about my father's business. People are waiting for the moment when God tells you in front of everybody, you're called. He called you at 12. So there's no excuse for none of us in here. I don't care if you ain't married yet. You work on your singleness like your wedding is tomorrow. I don't care if you only got a dollar to your name. If you know your ministry, your business need to be able to you need you need to be able to manage millions. You better look at every dollar and where it's going. Like I said last week, check your bank statements and your bank statements will show you where your idols are. It will show you what you spend to help with your depressions. That's why you got to say, God, I'm going to work on my life until my life is in heaven, <laughs> until this vapor is blown out completely. Because the more you work on you and you get rid of certain lifestyles, you're able to manage more. Number two, you have to establish a strong commitment with God. Commitment is key. Decision says, or commitment says, my whole heart is committed to you. A man who's committed to two people Two women is not committed at all. A woman committed to two men are not committed at all. A person who's committed to two lifestyles is not truly committed at all. Have you made your calling and election sure? Have you been, are you committed? Are you saying, God, <clears throat> let's go. I'm committed to you. We're looking for lovers, but we're not looking for the lover of our soul. Your soul's not looking for a husband. Your soul's not looking for a wife. Your soul is looking for God. The missing piece in your heart is not somebody. It's not something. It's the Savior, Jesus himself. The Jesus of the Nazareth did live, did die. And he says, you know, the reason what, what caused me to leave my earthly throne was because I know I'm the only piece to fill that hole in your heart. And if you don't accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, People only accept him as Savior, but never Lord. But you got to say, God, I'm not just thankful that you saved me. I'm thankful that you're my Lord today. You're saved from hell, but his Lordship saves you every day. <laughs> That's powerful. Listen, we were saved from hell. Great. Kudos. Two stars. But in order for his Lordship, in order for me to be saved Daily, he needs to be my Lord daily. Every day I need his saving work. Every day he must be my Lord. So I must establish a strong commitment with God. Number, two, number three, I, in order for me to receive clear counsel from God, you must seek a calm spirit. You got to calm yourself down, man. Some of us are so emotional, so, so, so just everywhere you got to say God calm me down what we worrying about is not third world problems first world problem if a bomb drops in this country today we will have third world problems we better be committed to God and seek a calm spirit because you got to be calm in the midst of chaos if a bomb dropped today how calm will your spirit be if they talking about food shortages, how calm will your spirit be? When they talk about letting you go, how calm will your spirit be? Calmness comes from being consistent in his presence. People will be looking at you like, why you ain't panicking? He's my provider. I say this all the time, man. I'm, I'm, I'm gonna go check Google when I get off work to find the nearest brook. Because when a bomb drops in somewhere and they talk, I'm going to the nearest brook and I'm going to be looking for ravens. And I'm going to tell God, you did it for my man Elijah, you'll do it for me. You should be sitting on your front porch, everybody panicking and be like, I don't know how I'm going to eat them all, but I sure is going to eat. <laughs> I sure is going to eat. <laughs> because when your spirit is calm, your God needs calm people to still 
push his kingdom in the midst of chaos. You got to be calm to be able to still push. Number last, not number last, but you got to remove the clutter, chatter, and poor community out of your life. In order to receive counsel from God, you must remove the clutter, chatter, and the poor community. You got to remove the clutter. Listen, we hoarding so many stuff. We got to remove. We got to become almost uh, minimalist. We got to be like, you know, I don't need all these clothes. I don't need all these shows. I don't need Netflix. I don't need this. I don't need Hulu. I don't need all this. Because clutter clouds our judgment. I got to also make sure that I remove chatter. I got to remove certain people. People who's always talking. People who always got an opinion about your life. They should, be, they should pray more for you than give an opinion about you. Listen, if you always got something to say about how I should live my life, you must, your life must be, you must be Jesus. The only one that should be telling me about my life all the time should be the perfect one, the Christ, the one, the Savior of my soul. Not, listen, anyway. You also got to remove poor communities. Some of us are around some poor caliber, low grade Christians. We're around certain people like, well, 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 God loves you. Go on sin. His grace is sufficient. We're around so many Christians that keep that, that subtly, subconsciously give us clearance to still sin without correction. You got to find the right friends. Next, you got to understand and embrace contentment. Contentment is key. Are you content with the season that you're in? There's a difference between being content and not being content. They're both okay in the right terms. Am I truly content at the state of my life right now? No. But I am, am I content in where he has placed me? Yes. Do I still want to be greater? Do I still want to be the best version of myself? Do I really want to be here? Do I really want to wear Walmart clothes all the time? Do I really? I'm sponsored by George. <laughs> y'all don't even know George. George is a Walmart brand. Anyway, sponsored by George. <laughs> Holler at me. If you're watching right now, listen, I'll take any type of advance. I'll wear George all the days of my life. Give me $2 million and I'll wear George all the days of my life. Anyway, but you got to get to a place where you say, you know what? What am I trying to say? <laughs> Next point. <laughs> I'm tired, y'all. Uh, I must build conditioning and be prepared and able to carry. God has you set aside to condition you. Everything in life requires training like a marathon more so than a sprint. We train for marriage like it's a sprint. We train for marriage like it's a hundred yard dash versus building our conditioning so that when we get to that marriage and we get to having children, we get to a ministry, when we get to success, whatever success is for you, when you get there, you're now able to carry it. You got to build your spiritual lungs up enough so that you can endure this race. It's your responsibility to say, you know what? I'm going to try to memorize a verse a week. I'm going to try to pray an extra, you know, a five minutes a week. Start where you can start. Ain't nobody telling you. There ain't no elite prayer club. <laughs> there ain't no club where only those who can read two hours, pray two hours a day. The only people who can make this club. God just say, just give me a good five minutes. And then he's going to let us take that five to ten. Let's take it to 20 because cancer is going to hit your mom. So let's try to get you to about an hour. You're going to go through this. So I'm trying, I got to get your prayer life to this level so that you'll be able to pray through it. Many of us got a five minute prayer life in a, <laughs> in a, in a world where we need a lot of prayer endurance. You got to say, listen, <laughs> and when you touch your forehead and you can't pray a headache off and you can't endure trials, and you can't pray through suffering, then your condition is not strong. But God, I want to carry a marriage. You can't even pray yourself out of a lust addiction. How are you going to be able to carry a marriage? But God, I'm ready for children, and you still got childlike tendencies. God, I'm ready for millions. You can't even handle $5. God's saying, I got to mold you so that you can eventually manage. Can you carry? Are you conditioned enough? Can you run 20 miles? Only those who are conditioned for 20 miles can actually run the 20 miles. Some of us, we try to run a mile. We halfway dead. So, Lord, let somebody chase you. <laughs> Listen, you got to be able to say, you ain't catching me. 
pace yourself. <laughs> Unless you're getting chased by someone that's more conditioning. But anyway, I ain't going to be able to finish this. I'll do belonging to God next week, but let me get to my final, final thoughts. I'm going to go to these real quick. You see, number one, you seek counsel through seeking silence. In order to get clear counsel from God, you seek counsel through seeking silence. How noisy is your life? When you silence your life, he'll send you counsel. Receiving counsel is not everything, man. Applying it is where the butter and the, hold on, that's where it's at. God been done told us, done counseled us, and we still don't listen. That's why if you silence your life, he'll send you counsel. And when you have submitted your life, you'll apply the counsel. Number two, silence is golden, noise is overrated. We gotta ask, you gotta ask yourself, is my thoughts more tormenting or are my thoughts treasure? If you got too much in your life, then your thoughts are gonna be more tormenting than thoughts of treasure. I guarantee if you remove a lot of stuff out of your life, you'll find the golden thoughts come through. But when you got all this junk up here, you're only gonna be tormented by it. Number three, don't give volume to the wrong voices. Don't give volume to the wrong voices. Whatever voice you honor most is your voice of hope. Your victories are predicated on the voices you listen to most. Don't give volume to, don't, I mean, don't even turn it up a little bit. Don't give any volume to the wrong voices. A wrong voice is a voice that doesn't compare to God's word. The wrong voice is, is a voice that doesn't bear witness with your spirit. Do you know what that means? Bear witness. Like your spirit says, we check off on that. Next. Wherever you lack wisdom, work hard in that area until you obtain it. Don't avoid what you need to address. If you want to advance, address immediately. Wherever you lack wisdom, work hard in that area until you obtain it. Number five, in order to receive counsel from God, we must be committed to being still. Oh, did I, is this in y'all notes? Oh, my bad. I, I, oh, number six, number five for you. You can't carry a problem and a prescription at the same time and expect to be prosperous. You have to let one go. Number seven, true help endeavors to help everyone live properly. True help, acronym, true help endeavors to help everyone live properly. And you can't live properly without the help of God. If, if someone's trying to help you and it's not helping you live properly, that's not God, godly help. Next week we'll talk about when the Bible says in verse 7, I bless the Lord who gives me counsel. In the night also my heart instructs me. We're going to talk about uh, how to endure the night and how your heart can be used at nighttime for your advantage. But I challenge you today to steal your life. I challenge you to condition yourselves. I challenge you to really remove the clutter and I challenge you to stay in position. Rushing ruins. When you rush into it, you have the highest chance of ruining it. What's the rush for? The rapture didn't go come yesterday. It, it, listen, man, rather it's a rapture, whether you mid-trib, post-trib, or pre-trib, I just know he's coming for me. But death may come before he comes for me. So I'm going to be like Jesus when his mom and dad was coming looking for him. He looked at them like, did you not know that I'm about my father's business? When people come looking for you, come with up. I'm about my father's business. If you want to make your crooked path straight, make sure that you are relentless at receiving counsel from God and applying. Next week we'll talk more about applying. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you so much for this word. I pray it was a blessing. I pray that it rests on their hearts and I pray, Lord, that it will uh, enable them to be patient and poised to receive from you. God, everyone else's counsel is overrated and yours and our lives have been underrated. God, help us to be still. Help us to seek you. Help us to be patient until we hear from you. Slow us down, God, because if we're too busy to read and pray, that means our lives are too fast. Slow us down to seek you. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. For those watching on YouTube, listening online, 
watching on Facebook Live, wherever you watch, I want to say thank you guys so much for watching. I love you guys. I appreciate your support. With that being said, we will, we will love to have your support. There's links in the description box below. We start our mentoring program starting January 15th or 17th. <clears throat> we will love your support. If you want to give, there's links for you to give. If, you want, if you're in the Charlotte area, you're like, man, I want to come see you live. You can come at 3646 Central Avenue, et cetera, et cetera, Charlotte, North Carolina. But if you want to get me out to your city, I only go where I'm sent. But I'll come out there if you got some mini cents. Just joking. I want to go where God sends me, but you got to pay me. Anyway, I love you. Appreciate you. Thank you guys so much for watching.